You are now tuned in to Westworld FM, a podcast about HBO's Westworld. My name is Alex. And my name is Nick. Today we will be discussing Season 3, Episode 5 of the show, titled Genre. We will not be discussing the next time on preview at the end of the episode, but we will be spoiling everything through Season 3, Episode 5 of the series. So please pause and go catch up if you're not current on the show. You can find more episodes of our podcast at westworld.fm. We're also Westworld FM on Twitter, and you can send feedback to westworldfm at gmail.com to tell us what you think of our show and share your thoughts on HBO's Westworld. Send us corrections, observations, or anything regarding Westworld or our podcast. If you enjoy this show or any other show on the Midwest Podcast Network, please consider heading over to patreon.com slash midwestpodnet and pledge as little as a dollar a month to make our network even better. Special thanks to Jason K and Gojo who have pledged at the level of ten dollars per month. Uh, Midwest Game Nerds, we talked about the Resident Evil Three remake this past weekend. Um, the horror movie yearbook guys just talked about nineteen eighty five Fright Night, the original Fright Night. So please give those a listen if you are interested in them at all. But we'd love to have more people listening to our stuff. Always. There's also <clears throat> plenty of episodes about uh, AMC's Preacher, which we. Still need to wrap up at some point in the future. And uh, also, whenever the sequel series to The Alienist is going to come out now. Yeah. There's not a date for that yet, is there? No, no. <clears throat> they've never, they haven't, they've always been kind of quiet about that one. Even for the first season, I feel like we didn't know it was coming until pretty, pretty, you know, close to. So we will, we will have to see, but. You know, who knows what kind of delays they're seeing because of the the pandemic. So, right, yeah, but I want to reread that. Yeah, and yeah. now after today, I also really need to accelerate my reread of Dune. Mm, Dune, yes, Dune, Dune. Yeah, I have to assume that Denis Villeneuve just moved in with his editor for the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, all right, we're working. <laughs> yeah, he's sleeping on the floor of the post house. Yeah. Uh, how you doing? You good? You're all right. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. We're hanging in. Yeah, we're dealing. Yep. Yep. Our baby is now fully aware of her ability to scream <laughs> and just make a ruckus in general. Sometimes for no apparent reason. Yeah. So she's she's definitely reached like an emotional and mental stage where she like seems to understand like cause and effect <laughs> it's, it's just one lesson to learn <laughs> yeah yeah for all of us yeah it's uh yeah so it's been interesting it's definitely we're definitely um reaching the the kind of upper limits of what we can all handle the three of us just being stuck at home and my yeah. wife and i both trying to work and both trying to watch her and her just having to deal with, you know, the world and then learning. So, yeah, it's just, you know, it's an adventure. That's yeah. for sure. But yeah, everybody's good and everything's fine. It's just, well, you good. know, daily, daily challenges. Yeah. Yeah. How Same stuff you? that other people are facing too. I'm fortunate enough that I don't have a newborn right now, but yeah. I can imagine yeah. there are many people out there dealing with the same or even more mm-hmm. children or who knows so oh my god yeah i can't even imagine <laughs> good luck to those of you out there homeschooling your children because <coughs> you know my wife's yeah. a teacher i've heard how 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 difficult it can be and and how much uh how much parents are currently struggling and taking all the help they can get so yeah let's get on with the episode recap uh, we open with Sirach reflecting on his life as he speaks to Rehoboam. He speaks highly of his brother as the only reason they survived Paris after, or after Paris was bombed. Seeing the chaos in the world, they knew they needed, they knew that humanity needed a god, so they cut, sought to create one. He also mentions that there are things that Rehoboam can't predict. We cut to Sirac meeting with the president of Brazil, informing him of a nascent separatist movement that he's completely unaware of. Sirac essentially offers to quash the movement if the president agrees to undo a manganese extraction exclusivity agreement. The president perceives this as a threat, but Serac informs the president that he wouldn't be president without the help of insight, and if he doesn't agree to end the manganese extraction deal, Serac is just as happy to deal with his predecessor in several weeks, who stands mere feet away as a member of the military. 
Um, this episode's very much focused on Serac, as we have kind of seen with some of the episodes being very character heavy. Um, <clears throat> but what did you think about this kind of conceit of Serac discussing his life with Rehoboam? It was it was interesting because initially I kind of figured that's who he was speaking to, but I wasn't sure. You know, I was yeah. kind of waiting for the reveal and. You know, I wonder when that conversation is taking place or if it even is taking place out loud at all, or if he's just kind of, you know, musing to himself. The Paris bombing thing is pretty insane. Like that's, um, <clears throat> I don't know, you hear, you know, in, in fiction like this about when major cities go down, I feel like pa for some reason it never seems like Paris is on the list, at least not early on, or if it is, it's like, it's later, but to, it seems like it's the only city in the world that's been hit by a bomb like that. We don't, at least that we know of. Yeah. And it's I'm just kinda, kind of an interesting choice. Uh, I, I feel like there maybe is a little bit more information about why Paris, uh, I, I'm not sure about that, but there might be some stuff in like the alternate reality things that they've been doing. Um, yeah, that could unfortunately, be. I haven't necessarily kept up on that. But yeah, it seems like an interesting choice of like, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it's like the only reason you would want to harm Paris in particular is because of the history of it all. Right. I mean, it's mm. one of those very old European cities that has a lot to it. It's not like you're taking out a manufacturing center of the world or like anything like that. But. Yeah. I'd be curious to see why they made that choice. The uh so right away in the in the first real scene here with the president of excuse me. <clears throat> is it is it Brazil? Yes. Okay. Let me start that over. I <laughs> 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 okay. The uh, right away in this episode, it's funny. I kind of was eating my own, my own words because right during this first scene with the president of Brazil, I was like, "Okay, this is why they cast Vince Cassell because he just like he just he just <laughs> he's just cool, man. He's yeah. really really cool." <laughs> well, there's there's a really really good quote from Lisa Joy in the like after episode kind of behind the scenes look that they did. Okay. And the quote was casting Vincent Cassell was a no brainer. I actually remember on the phone talking to him about the character. He's intelligent. He's beguiling. He's charismatic and he's powerful. And he said, I can see why you wanted to cast me. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, he, yeah. well, I think part of it too is his physicality is so interesting. He's a lot like Mads Mikkelsen, the way he, he moves and like walks is just very like, there's just like a presence to it. It's somebody who clearly is very like physical. And uh, mm -hmm. I know Mads Mikkelsen was like a dancer and a gymnast. So that explains that. I don't know what Vincent Cassell's background is, but all that like cool capoeira stuff he was doing in uh, Ocean's 12, which was mm -hmm. 2000, I don't know, three or something like that when that yeah. came out, 2002. So I'm assuming he, he practices some sort of martial art or something like that. I also saw... The people online were praising his Portuguese and his Portuguese accent, and they were saying that it was better, it was more authentic than the actor who was playing the Brazilian president. Yeah, they were like, app apparently, Vincent Cassell lived or lives in Brazil, yeah, and uh, so his Portuguese is like top notch for someone who's not a native. And uh, I thought that was really funny that he's able to just do that. And because I remember, I, I mean, I have, I do not no whatsoever what a proper portuguese accent is or pronunciation is supposed to be like but in the scene when he was started speaking portuguese i remember thinking like man that's got to be hard to like learn lines in a foreign language like that and 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 not only act it that well but deliver it so compellingly but it turns out he just knows that language really well so it wasn't a big deal <laughs> better than the guy who was playing the brazilian president which is really funny well and also i think portuguese is rooted in french too <clears throat> Is maybe my understanding as yeah. somebody who's not a linguist or knows anything about Portuguese. Um, I know so it's, it's really least, close to you know, Spanish it, too, because like some Spanish speakers were weighing in saying they could understand what was being said, but they like couldn't uh, couldn't authentically replicate the accent necessarily. Yeah, let me. I don't know. It's me, interesting. I wonder. But anyway, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that he's uh, you know such a multi-talented guy. 
and uh, he just yeah, he's got that look, and the and that they found a young guy who looks as much like him as he does is really funny. Yeah, that that is pretty incredible. Like the that casting. I mean, they, it it was a little weird to me later in the episode when you see dark hair Vincent Cassell, and you're just kind of like, does that really happen in the fifteen or ten years that ensued between these two points of time that we're seeing? But hard I hard mean, living with Rehoboam. <laughs> It's true. The genius comes at a price, right? Yeah, but, especially uh, once he's the only one driving the ship. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, well, and that was the weird thing is that I, I don't think they changed actors for his brother, mm. and I didn't quite get the feel of who was the older and who was the younger. I thought Jean Me was the older one because he was the one that was like, "No, we need to leave. We need to get going. We need." To yeah, keep I moving. think he is too. So so it was kind of weird to me that they didn't like, they didn't age up the brother like they aged up <laughs> Vincent Cassell. I was like, eh, all right, but okay. They gave him a beard. Yeah, oh, you look he, old now. He was still just as blonde though, so <laughs> yeah. it was kind of weird. He's got the he just got the better genes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about the scene, just kind of like showing the uh, the power that Rehoboam gives uh, Sirach. The idea that he can kind of come in and say, "Hey, here's this thing." Yeah. Uh, and, and and I can either feed it or I can get rid of it, and I can trade you for something that I want. I think is very yeah. compelling, and it, and it maybe isn't. I mean, you see the the quid pro quo, you know, to use the parlance of times of the times and get into some of the political stuff going on previously <laughs> this year. But anyway. Just kind of the idea of like, I will take care of this for you if you do this thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I it it's just it gets kind of very plainly laid out later with Dempsey Senior, but to kind yeah. of see him using it earlier on in the episode here, and you kind of get that like, ooh, this is what he's doing with this. That's what I was thinking too. Like the the scene with Dempsey Senior, it became pretty apparent, especially in that moment, that he had been going around and like basically securing all the power for himself behind the scenes, being like, I'm the one with the ultimate bargaining chip. So people are going to have to, you know, do my bidding. Well, and the interesting thing to me is, is that he seems motivated that it's not all for him. He's doing it for the sake of humanity. That's the guise that he's put it under anyway. Right. So yeah, I don't even I mean, necessarily it, know that like he <laughs> needs to use the manganese extraction stuff. Like, is he? Do- he's not doing that for his own like interest necessarily. Maybe, but maybe for the future of humanity, it's something that he's he wants to ensure for something else to happen. Right? Who knows? Hmm. That's true. But. Uh, we'll it, it's just kind of interesting to me like he's he's the one that's authoring history at this point is what it's what we're meant to think and to see how he's doing that i think was very interesting and pretty terrifying too so anything else about that opening mm, don't think so all right Sirak continues his introspective journey. He explains that he and his brother Jean Mi partnered with Liam Dempsey Sr. and Insight because of their access to money and data. Dempsey Sr. was unimpressed with the multiple iterations of the system, Saul, David, and now Solomon. John Mee tries to tout the fact that it has predicted past events with certainty, but Dempsey Sr. doesn't understand why that is useful. John Mee tells Engeron that they should just kill Dempsey Sr., and Sirak explains that his brother did actually accomplish what they set out to do. Um, The introduction to Dempsey Sr. I think is interesting. I was kind of... It's weird to me that we didn't spend more time seeing his relationship with Liam. We kind of got this one scene of it, and and that's about it. And it was mm-hmm. him swinging his dick around over his investment into their system. But, um, you know, <laughs> there were a lot of people comparing him to Adam Schiff, the one of the... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the impeachment managers for Donald Trump's impeachment, which... I didn't make that connection, but uh, there were there seemed to be a lot of people that agreed on Reddit. So yeah, that's funny. I didn't see that. I thought uh, he was making Blair uh, when he in that first scene, for sh- like a hundred percent. I thought it was him, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And I thought he just popped up in something else random too. 
Uh, he's the lead from Blue Ruin. Ah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he's popped up in a few supporting. He was like a supporting role in Green Room, and I think he's been in some other stuff now. But uh, I thought for sure it was him. And then I looked it up on IMDb, and it wasn't. I was like, oh, okay, my bad. And then, like, later in the episode when he showed up again, I was like, are they sure? And I, like, went to check again because I was like, that looks a lot like him. <laughs> but it's not. It, he doesn't look that much like That would have been interesting. Much. I like making Blair from from what I've seen of him. but um, Yeah, me too. Jefferson Mays is the person who actually plays. Well, <laughs> yeah. Who I don't, I don't, I don't know him from any of his credits, unfortunately. But the the more um, this episode went on, the more like I I said in the Discord that it felt like it was turning into Southland Tales because the show has taken this like uh, weird kind of absurdist <laughs> turn in this episode. It's kind of been going that way in in some regard but in this episode it it honestly feels like richard kelly directed it and like it's just filled with so many strange moments and obviously by design that's what the episode's kind of about but it just it feels like that movie to me and and i feel like the when marshawn lynch shows up again in that i'm like here's some of that kind of weird casting like they did in southland tales and i was like yeah I was like, this feels, and there was there was another actor that showed up that made me kind of do the same thing. I was like, this is weird. I don't remember who it was though. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So Macon Blair would have fit right in if that if that were what they were going for. Yeah, that's fair. Um, one, one. Uh, so he mentions that uh, Dempsey Senior mentions that he's giving them yottabytes of data, just for reference. That is. One trillion terabytes goes into one yottabyte. One trillion terabytes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of data. So it's a shitload of data. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. Probably on that rate. Uh, we're 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 on that curve. Of, I'm sure Jonah Nolan or Lisa Joy looked at it and was like, "Yeah, this is probably where we'll be in 2025 or whenever." I, I'll be able to go to Best Buy and get my Western Digital. <laughs> portable yottabyte <laughs> yeah 12 12, 12 yottabyte uh, western digital drive yeah 84.99 <laughs> yeah um but yeah no i think it's just a very interesting the uh the fact that the iteration thing was true that i had i had heard previously the saul david solomon and rehoboam mm. uh it's pretty 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 cool i think it's fun and i wonder like what I, go ahead go, uh, mm. I wonder what make what is the event that causes them to redesignate the device. Like, I wonder what if it's with each version or if it's like every five versions. If they make a bit, you know what I mean. Like, I wonder if it's the fourth. I mean, it's obviously the fourth iteration, but uh, I want you know what? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. What what? It's like uh, it. Well, like what causes you to go from version one point two, one point three, one point? When do you yes. finally decide to go to two point oh? 2.0 yep exactly yeah same thing you know when you get your playstation firmware update you're like why is this one five and not it's usually yeah. like they save the bigger features for the point release they call it a point release right that and, makes sense. and so what uh yeah i don't know maybe that's when they introduce even more data They're or hot, who knows. hot fixing rehoboam well the hot fixes would be you know rehoboam point one yeah a rehoboam point oh one slash five one point one point one five yeah 4d 3d 3d3 anyway but yeah. uh yeah no i think it's a it, it's a cool little conversation mm-hmm. and i like getting the serac background i we're getting more serac background in this episode than i thought we were going to get for a long time anyway. yeah me too yeah so, there's a lot in this episode that happens that i was like hmm, i thought that'd be like an episode yeah. six seven eight kind of thing mm-hmm. if i'm getting a little bit ahead but there in by the <laughs> All the words are just stuck at the exit, trying to get out. <laughs> there were multiple times in this episode, but especially near the end, where I was like, "Man, it feels like they think this is their last season." Like it, this feels to me the way I felt when I was watching Preacher season four. I'm kind of like, it feels like they know it's the end, and they're trying. Interesting. To... I don't think that's necessarily the case, but it just—I don't know. I kind of got had that. F- it's an indescribable feeling that it kind of happened. It struck me a few times this episode and I was like, it feels that's like really curious. Cause I mean, I had the similar feeling of what happens by the end of this episode. I thought was going to be like a season ending event probably, but mm-hmm. 
it didn't necessarily strike me the same the same way the same way that it did you especially seeing how accelerated they moved through some of the things in preacher like and and, and that's right. the weird thing like i feel like there's a we have no great context as to what type of situation westworld is in other than the fact that ratings got worse from season 1 to 2 and they got even worse from season 2 to 3 so far and so there's a world where Westworld doesn't get a season four, but I have to imagine there was part of them that was like, we need to make the season satisfying to end, but also continuable if it does do well. Right. Right. Would be my guess, but I feel like HBO is the type of network just from an artistic perspective, but also they have the money to just say, we will give you the courtesy season four to close off your story. That's true. They, I mean, they, they are such a critically, they're just jam packed with critically lauded stuff. Like HBO mm-hmm. is like a, it's got to be a thing there at that network to like really take care of your your brand and your brands and 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 take care of your shows and your showrunners, especially if they're giving you quality. Because I think, <clears throat> excuse me, with all the with their catalog, how far back it goes in terms of uh, where we are now and where we will be with streaming. You know, they they might know if we end this series properly, it's going to give it more resale value, so to speak, down the road. Later People on, are going to yeah. watch it and stream it more if they know that it's a complete story. So even if they do a six episode fourth season just to top it off cleanly, it's going to benefit them in the long run. And that I don't know why I'm not I'm not basing this on anything real that I know, but it just feels like they're that type of network based on well, just, even, even the things that they green light. I mean, they're things that are risky ventures, right? But not even they, just they that, for it. but also like the idea that with Westworld in the first place that they gave it more time to figure out in the middle of season one what they wanted to do. Like they hit pause in the middle of the season. They give them longer than a year to come out with another season, you know, yeah. things that happened with True Detective season two to season three. And lengthening Game of Thrones cycles as well. Like it, it, it you know that they kind of. I, I mean, with Game of Thrones, maybe it was a money thing, but I feel like with Westworld and True Detective, it's kind of a, they they learned we don't want to let the product suffer because we just want to get out immediately. Exactly. People will come back if, if it's, if, you know, when, when we're ready for them to, right? But mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, ultimately, dollars and cents are going to be the the deciding factor, but it's not the only factor at play for them. Like, I I don't feel like that's the case. Whereas a yeah. lot of other networks I've, and 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 streaming platforms, they might be guilty of more knee jerk or strictly fiscal decision making. Where HBO doesn't need to do that. <laughs> yeah, even <laughs> less a, so than like which is an a very AMC. fortunate position to be in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Fair. Yeah, we'll have to see. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. I don't know if anybody if anybody said anything that has indicated anyway between like L- Nolan and Joy. But if anybody's heard anything, let us know. <laughs> um, all right. Sirak is informed that Rehoboam analyzed traffic coming out of the Yakuza facility, and had found a connection between the encrypted between encrypted devices in Jakarta, Berlin, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. The one in L.A. is a problem because it was from inside Liam Dempsey Jr.'s private compound. Serac requests that they find Dempsey, but Dempsey is missing, uh, and he was at a private event that Dolores was spotted at. Serac asks for all assets to be activated to track down Dolores. Uh, for this part, I just want to explain that Serac's airplane is really awesome, and I want one. That is cool. Um, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> and I want one. <laughs> yes. I don't know if... Um, well, and I like that as they were traveling at night, it was all dark, but by the end of the episode, it's light again, and you can kind of just see the panoramic windows, you know, it's, it's, it is very cool. Um, I don't know if the connection to the encrypted devices in Jakarta, Berlin, San Francisco, and LA is meant to tip us off to... Yeah, I don't know. I wondered the same thing, and I was like, I don't have the time or mental capacity right now to try to piece together <laughs> who these might represent. But I was like, I'm somebody will like it, it, The thing is, is like if, if she had five pearls, one of them is Bernard, you know, the San Francisco one is Connell's and then she had the Yakuza one was Musashi, but Jakarta and Berlin and LA, I don't know who knows, but 
Maybe there's smarter people than us on the case. Let's hope so. so. Uh, next up, Dolores, Caleb, and Liam are on the move to prevent Serac from tracking them. Caleb has also called for backup. Dolores explains that they need Liam still to get access to Rehoboam. Liam explains that even if they have the key, they need to be at a node in the system to access it. Dolores gives Liam AR glasses to look her up, and there is nothing about her in the system. Liam tries to peel Caleb away from Dolores and fails as Caleb blames Liam and insight for everything wrong in his life. Liam looks Caleb up and appears shocked at who he, who is standing before him. Before Caleb can get any answers out of him, Liam injects him with the genre drug and tries to flee, but Dolores catches him and Caleb uh, and gets Caleb back on his feet as they head topside. Um. It didn't strike me how uh, shocked Liam was about Caleb until my second watch. Yeah, I didn't really get that, but I only watched it once, so um, there, there you go. It, it it just the the especially coupled with rewatching it and seeing the stuff at the end of the episode, there just seems something very massive about who Caleb is that I wasn't expecting, like. I thought we were over this. I thought we learned that he was a soldier and, you know, you know, his mom has, uh, his mom has dementia or Alzheimer's and can't remember who he is. And that's why she thinks he's not her son, but it seems like there's another can of worms being opened here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll talk. I mean, we could talk about that a little more later. Yeah, that works. Um, and yeah, this is where he says, you think I killed your friend? Which, you know, by the end of the episode, we think it's probably Caleb. But we can talk about that then. Um, Alright, so this is the drug trip, or where it starts. Caleb drugs take hold, takes hold and places him into a black and white film noir. Dolores collects supplies from her robobike and calls a rideshare to get away from people pursuing them. As they are trailed by a car, the rideshare pulls, gets pulled over for an amber alert. Several cars roll up, and people with guns get out. Dolores uses the situation to pressure Dempsey Jr. into giving his access key to Rehoboam. Dolores reprograms the car on the fly. Caleb enters a war film genre as Ride of the Valkyries starts playing. Caleb misses their pursuers with a grenade launcher, but the grenade has drone capabilities and finds its way back to its target. Dolores stops the car to prepare for the next two cars behind them. The first car is intercepted and blown up by the robobike, and the second pulls up and the men get out and start firing. Caleb switches genres again, again into a romance film, and eventually Caleb starts firing too, and they start to retreat. Liam almost meets the wrong end of a gun, but Caleb's reinforcements, Ash and Giggles, show up to save the day. What did you think of the, the genre drug? The genre. Genre. Uh, you know, I felt pretty proud of myself, to be honest, because for the first few episodes of this show, I've been talking about film noir, how many, yeah, and I even said in one of the episodes that the, <clears throat> that Nolan and Joy are having a lot of fun playing around with the genre, Yeah, and lo and behold, there's a whole episode about it, and they yeah. I think they definitely were kind of, I guess, I don't know if they were foreshadowing it necessarily, but the, it, the influence was, they were wearing it on their sleeve, and it's funny mm-hmm. that they just got, they found a way to lean into it with absolutely no bearing on the plot of the episode. Like yeah. this is here purely for fun. Like they're mm-hmm. just flexing their nuts and having a good time. <laughs> and I kind of love that because it's not, that's not Westworld like that. This is a very unusual, again, man, it feels like Southland tales. There's like, there's that part <laughs> in the middle of Southland tales. There's a musical break and a musical number for yeah. no reason. Yeah. No reason. Uh, but it's entertaining and this is really entertaining, but it has, it just doesn't matter. It's really funny. I well, I think I, I enjoyed it for that. I, I could see people being upset, especially if this does end up being the last season, I could see people being like, why'd you waste an episode on farting around with this like genre thing? Genre bending bullshit. Yeah. And it, it, it might have a larger impact, but I really, I mean, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I was kind of curious. Like, it honestly, it seems like a pretty cool drug. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> right? I think, I think it'd be an interesting experience. <laughs> but um, yeah, his... you, you would just be stuck in like a Kevin Smith movie, and then like a <laughs> Limp Bizkit music video, and then <laughs> yeah, that's a, the bad trip. A that's Creed, you're like... yeah, a Creed concert being filmed in <laughs> VR. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's like if you're not if you're not in like a good place with people that you can trust and love, then you end up uh, you end up tripping your way into like a fucking trauma film. And... Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, or like a uh, Asylum Productions uh, movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. But uh, no, it, it's weird. It's kind of like a little bit of icing on the cake of like just this. It's kind of a fun explanation. And that's the thing. I guess I have to wonder if there's anybody out there who was like, what the fuck were they doing? Um, But I don't know. Uh, Joanna Robinson did do like a write up of the different genres and this, the, um, the film noir one is the only music cue that, uh, Ramin Javadi got to create himself. Okay. The rest of the genre music cues are actually taken from their other like, uh, orchestral pieces like, um, Ride of the Valkyrie or, um the night club in by Iggy pop. So it's other source yep. music or things like that. But, um, no, I thought it was an interesting and fun way to kind of play with this. What is, what is mostly <laughs> like an A to B kind of plot, you know, for sure. Yeah. So. I definitely spiced it up a little bit. It was interesting. And Aaron Paul, I mean, he plays under the influence very well, as we know. And yeah. he, his ability to emote through all that was really impressive. <laughs> yeah, I really, I, like I really point... wanted Lady in Red to kick in during the romance <laughs> one, but it just, uh, you know, we need to edit before. that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I feel like there was probably some point where, like, he's they're like filming him for these shots, and he's just like, "Are, are you sure you still need? Do you still need to be looking at me? Do I still need to react to this thing? Do you think we got enough of that already?" But yeah, I could see him they're... just being like. Just knowing, like, what a witty and funny guy Aaron Paul is, just being on set and being like, "What kind of movie am I in now?" Just tell me. <laughs> you're a, you're in an action slash war film. Okay. What am I All in right. now? Now it's a romance. <laughs> okay. I got it. Well, and the fun thing is that, like, I like how when Giggles walks up, he knows. Yeah. Like he's the one that's like, "Oh, you're on that genre shit, man." And like, I want to know how he knew. Was it like? who 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 knows really but like is he able to look at caleb and kind of just like i don't know i guess maybe he wasn't making it he made it pretty obvious that he was like staring at dolores a lot but i don't know it's just I, it's kind of funny like mm-hmm. just to kind of wonder how exactly that works um but yeah no it was it was a pretty cool sequence the start of it mm-hmm. um all right Dolores uh, forwards Liam's key to Connells, who is back at Insight HQ with Bernard in tow. Connells explains to Bernard that Rehoboam is the human's god, and Bernard wants to know what Dolores wants with it. He asks Connells if he has ever questioned with the, uh, what Dolores is asking him to do. Connells stops momentarily but continues on, sending Sir X's Insight profile back to Dolores at her request. Caleb enters another genre with Iggy Pop's night climbing playing as they all take a seat on the subway and head west. Um... I liked that Bernard was very much the one trying to ply these other Delori away from their their programming, uh, as you've been kind of hinting at all along. And it seems like this particular one was very steadfast in, like, this is the mission. It's good for the mission, you know? But, <laughs> <laughs> like, I have to wonder if other others of them... Like, it doesn't feel like Charlotte Hale would be the one to, to buck her programming or not, but who knows? Like, as they said, she felt as though Charlotte was, like, clawing her way out of her. Yeah, she's a little fractured, I think. Yeah. So, curious if that's the last we'll see of this idea, especially knowing how Connell's meets his end by the end of the episode. But <clears throat> Yeah, I really liked the... the qu- I mean, we, we kind of posited this theory, I think, last week or two weeks ago, that will the Dolores sees have their, have their own motives? Will they have any agency? Mm-hmm. And it seems like the answer now is yes. If they, if they choose to, which is really cool. I like that a lot. I like that Dolores. The, yeah. I, I feel like that that's going to come back to, to, to play for sure. The idea that it could happen and that Bernard is like actively seeking that maybe, <laughs> or trying to, 
understand why they would choose or not choose to do something differently, I think is, is interesting. So we'll see. Maybe the mysterious fourth host will end up being a Bernard ally rather than a Dolores. Mm. Uh, but who knows? You think it might be Stubbs? I saw somebody online saying they thought maybe there's a chance it was Stubbs. Oh. Well. Somebody pointed out, and it doesn't come into play until later this episode, but after their little encounter when they're when they're walking down the catwalk together the three of them Stubbs and connell's have the exact same kind of movements they like they straighten their jackets and their cuffs like at the exact same time Uh and i just i just (laughs) took it as a comedic beat because i was like this is funny these two like roughneck guys are like they're about to fight but then they don't so it's like something that would be in like a john wick movie they would walk away yeah. and at the exact same time go through the same ticks of straightening themselves to look like they weren't just about to be in a fight. But then somebody <laughs> was like, what if they're both Dolores is and they're, and they're just kind of, you know, I don't think that's necessarily true, but I thought it was a fun thought. Well, and, and that's kind of fun. Also looking back at their, at Dolores and Stubbs conversation with each other before they fight as well. Mm. It's kind of the, this isn't your fight. You didn't need to be here, but yeah, it's not personal. Yeah. 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 Who knows? Interesting. Yeah, the the I I hope we get a lot more of this kind of the Dolores is getting kind of evolving into their own individuals. If you yeah. ever get around to reading any X Factor, this is one of the things I love so much about Multiple Man is just yeah. that his dupes will all they're all like a they're all duplicates of him, but they have different facets of his personality that come to the forefront so you might have like if you think about yourself or i think about myself i made a duplicate of myself one might be like my more compassionate side coming out one might be the more sardonic sarcastic side coming out one might be more apathetic like they're all different aspects of your personality and i think that they are all as with our our individual identities and personalities they're all shaped by our experiences right so dolores Mm -hmm. prime can't she literally doesn't have the same experiences that Connell's does. So every encounter that he has, every uh, every red light he hits in traffic, every person who holds the door for him, every uh, every stranger who greets him is going to impact him and shape him differently than it would Dolores Prime because she's just physically not there. Yeah. And so I feel like it's inevitable that they will all Kind of diverge exactly yeah and become yeah. their own individuals which is really something i hadn't thought about in this perspective before but now that we kind of have confirmation of it i'm open to thinking about it more and i'm like you know what that's uh that's really cool like i i really yeah. want to get more into that especially with Hale, because it seemed like she was already kind of on the brink a little bit anyway so it'd be cool to to explore that a little more absolutely i agree um the caleb nightclubbing sequence uh joanna robinson kind of pointed out that it was most likely some type of it seems like it could be a callback to uh train Train spotting spotting. yeah Mm -hmm. that's what i thought right away between it kind of it weirdly reminded me of the ending of train spotting with all the lights and stuff like that like there's just the final sequence when ewan mcgregor's running uh but it doesn't look that much like it. So I don't know why it reminded me of that, but just on some level, there's like, they're going down the escalators and there's all the different lights. It, it feels almost like mm-hmm. a casino interior. Uh, but then yeah, nightclub club and playing and right away, I just thought of, thought of train spotting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. In another chapter of Sirach's introspective journey, we see that he and his brother succeeded in making the system they wanted to, but Dempsey senior wanted proof. They made an example with the stock market. They showed him a 15 minute, 15 minute look ahead and then market close projections. He asked which of their projections will it be? And Sirak asked him which one does he want? <laughs> they stole 5 million from him a week prior and turned it into 100 million with their system. Dempsey was now on board, but for all the wrong reasons. Engeron and Jean Mi mapped out the future of humanity with their system and ultimately locked Dempsey out of it because he was only using it to benefit himself. We see that the Rehoboam interface actually represents a solar eclipse. When the projection and reality are aligned, a small ring of outliers is visible. Quote, outliers agitators who you couldn't predict or control. Sirach realized John Mee was one of them, and it drove his brother mad. Um, the stock market example was fucking incredible. 
the minute when Sirak is like, which one do you want? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> which is which is extra eerie because that's kind of how it works in a way. <laughs> like it responds to people's interest, basically, right? Like if yeah. everybody wants to, if everybody gets excited about something, they want to buy stock of it, it's going to drive it up. If everybody loses interest, like the this is so far beyond my ability to think because I'm not, I am such a poor math student and finance and and math and all that is just like it's so far beyond me but i'm really fascinated by it especially the way that the market moves up and down and and can it can be the best indicator of a recession or a boom just Mm -hmm. based on what people are buying how how they're buying who's buying who's selling what they're selling how much of it they're selling like it's just it's wild it's wild stuff and it's kind of the perfect example for them to use because it is so closely tied to our present world well in the way that Sirach kind of mentions it he's it like it, it he's like this is the example that we chose for dempsey senior because we knew he would understand it mm-hmm. you know it, it's almost like the this is the easy mode this is the very rudimentary example in the textbook that we can show you because Eventually, we will be able to do things like what Sirach is doing in the beginning of this episode, you know, like affecting the course of humanity by changing the choices that are being made there at that point in time, right? It's not so. dissimilar at all to Westworld itself. Like, you are, <laughs> like, this, <laughs> is this show ultimately just about, like, behavioral science and... <laughs> <laughs> behavioral scientists being able to manipulate us all into doing whatever they want us to do because Westworld's the same way, right? Like they they have all these different narratives around to draw you out based on your personality and to to seduce you into coming back, basically. Well, and it's all very much like there's so much about the design of apps and how if you put that red icon on an app, it brings somebody back to that thing to clear it away compulsively. Like Mm -hmm. you're hijacking the compulsive compulsive centers of somebody's brain to get them to do a thing that you want them to do, right? Spend more time in your app. And so to see it applied on a much more macro scale in the world, you know, it's, fascinating and terrifying because it's probably <laughs> happening right now it is all, this would knows? be i mean in while this show is going on and then in the years to follow whenever it's inevitably over would be a really awesome time to be in college because i feel like there are a lot of really awesome papers and lectures could happen based around this and yeah uh you know it, bringing these this psychology and behavioral science to the to the forefront of our minds i think is a really good play on their part (laughs) something to be aware of for sure it's funny like i I, uh i forgot to mention the article that i had tried to post in the discord earlier but the the uh, so there's an insider.com uh article that is titled jonathan nolan reveals the surprising sci-fi reference behind the mysterious westworld ai system rehoboam and I quote the article when I say, Brunner's Stand on Zanzibar, which won a coveted Hugo Award for, for Best Novel, follows an executive at a company called General Technics. The synopsis describes the sci-fi world as a place, quote, where society is squeezed into hive living madness by godlike megacomputers, mass marketed psychedelic drugs, and mundane uses of genetic engineering, end quote. Uh. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there's from some pretty major connections there but the name of the ai is called shalmaneser shalmaneser and shalmaneser 5 was a king of assyria uh, of assyria and babylon in the 8th century who subjugated israel so um i say all of these things to bring it back around to the fact that uh i i think it would be fun to have a list of all the things that jonah nolan and lisa joy were reading as they were feeding into what Westworld would be and as they're like I just want this like the definitive works of the influences of Westworld so that I can own that book and then never read it or the books it references at all (laughs) yeah it would look good on your shelf though (laughs) for sure it looks so good that reminds me of the um ah damn it what is it called the uh the baseline test from uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, 
It's from a book. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot what it's what it's called. The book Pale Fire. Apparently, it's a book within a book, though. The scene of Pale Fire is by Vladimir Nabokov, and it sounds like within the book, there's another book. But anyway, that's where that text comes from. That cells interlinked within cells interlinked, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I I read an article back when 2049 came out about this because I thought it was so interesting. I don't uh, clearly do not recall it that well, but I'm really curious about the connection and why they chose that book, why they chose that text. You know, I, I think that I did read something that kind of shed some light on it in an interview with uh, the writing team. But anyway, uh, I thought that was interesting. It's always cool to see where, you know, what these creatives bring into their projects with them. And that's so that's cool. I'm just look into that because that actually sounds like a great book. I mean, it's such a cool plot point for the show. It sounds like a really cool book. There's so much 60s and 70s science fiction that I know I would love, like anything by literally Isaac Asimov or uh, Heinlein or like any of the, the greats that I just am so averse to reading that I, you know, it... You'd, it you'd like me that I can't know these things yet, <laughs> even though I could. You'd like Fahrenheit 451 because it's about burning books, so you'd have a really I don't, good time with The it. thing is, I don't hate the books, though. <laughs> <laughs> he hates these books. <laughs> you're not angry at the books. You're angry no. at the reader for not reading I'm angry at myself for not reading the books. But anyway. Whatever. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that that is so impressive, though, that that story originates from the 60s. It's like all these great authors that were writing this stuff that was decades ahead of its time. I mean, Dune, if, when you ever end up listening to or reading Dune uh, in anticipation of the movie coming out, I think you'll be pretty blown away by how ahead of its time a lot of it is. Um, and I think, uh, you know, even in film, I, Blade Runner 2049 and also Westworld both remind me a little bit of this French movie from the 60s. I think it's from the 60s called Alphaville, which... Uh, hmm was a really cool movie I watched in college. I think it's from 68, I want to say, but I don't know if I'm basing it on a real number. But anyway, that, while watching that movie, I remember thinking like, man, there's a lot of stuff in here that is crazy. It was made this long ago. And it did... 1965. 65, man, I was close. Um, yeah, that movie was really, really interesting. And it did a cool job of blending sci-fi with like modern living, or at least contemporary living at the time. Like it felt like a sci-fi movie, but also felt like it was in the sixties. Like it didn't, it's kind of the way Westworld is like Westworld doesn't feel, I mean, technology wise, it feels way ahead, but like, as far as the way the world looks and feels, it doesn't feel so far away, which yeah, is really it's cool. The, it's the not too far future. Exactly. It's the year 20 XX or whatever. Like it's, it's, whereas you look at Blade Runner the, and you're like, Oh wow. Like that seems really far away. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On the subway, Ash wonders what's next. Dolores wants to open everyone's cages and send them the data that Insight has on them. Leon demonstrates that uh, why that's a bad idea on Giggles and Ash. Caleb monologues about a rat trap in his barracks when he was overseas, and how if the water was too high, the rats would struggle for hours because they had just enough hope. Dolores gives Connells the orders to send the files out to everybody, and the notifications start flying in the subway. People look on horrified at their futures, their children's futures, future suicides, and Alzheimer's diagnoses, and so much more. Ash asks if Insight knows this data for everyone, but Dolores explains that it's not just what they know, but what they decide for everyone. Connells tells Bernard that he has to pick a side, and Bernard tries to tell him that he doesn't have to die by Dolores' sword. But Connells explains that they all have their role to play, and not everyone will survive. Um, yeah, so... Uh, forgot to mention the last part when Connell sends the information back to Dolores we do see her kind of sifting through it with her contacts in her eyes mm -hmm. you see a little bit more light around her iris which I have to and plus her eyes are very active as she's like walking forward in a place it's very interesting I think I would be very bad at that but um, so this idea that everybody gets this information that Dolores had used to turn Caleb you know you get to take a look at the sum total of what your life is in the in, in the eyes of this faceless corporation, right? Um, I, I like I feel like it's a pretty accurate representation of what people would be going through if this amount of data were to come out mm -hmm. so quickly, and and you just watch everything devolve, not necessarily while they're on the subway, but even even when they get out. But 
either way, just kind of like, I don't know. It's crazy to me that like, it seems like anybody that we see on the streets reading this information, basically everybody has a bad story that's befalling them, right? It's not like we're seeing the Liam Dempsey's of the world open up their phone and be like, oh, you're doing great. You're going to live to be 95. You're going to retire here. You know, it's just kind of like all it, 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 it's, it seems like it's only like something that actually negatively affects the people who are being marginalized by Rehoboam. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it and definitely is the majority of the population, I would say. Yeah. You've probably got the 1%, so to speak, of people who are going to get positive outcomes. But at the end of the day, I feel like it's got to contain information about the end of your life, no matter who you right. are. And that's not going True. to be good for anybody. I mean, there's that question that people always ask, like, oh, if you, if you could find out when you were going to die, would you want to know? Yeah. How, how do you answer that question? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 like, would I like to know when I'm going to die? No, because I would just worry about it for the rest of my life. But if you knew, you wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> I would, I would, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I think it becomes a real paradox when <coughs> you start to think about, you know, when that date comes, what are you going to do? Like, are you going to try to prevent it? Like, can you? Is it going to be a Final Destination type thing? That's um, that's what would give me the problem. Like, I, I, you'd I stress would, out yeah. about, like, it's going to say, like, oh, the, you'll die at 74 years old of a car crash. And they'd be like, well, I just won't leave the house that day. Like, I'm never going to drive in cars again. <laughs> you can up until you're 74. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I traditionally always answered that question with yes. I was like, hell yes. Tell me when, because I want to know. Like, if I'm going to die at 35, I'm going to quit my job and go have some fun. But I get both sides. And, and you know, if if a genie or somebody came before me to actually present me with that, I probably would chicken out and say, no, I don't want to know. Because, yes, it would yeah. it would change your thinking about literally everything in that instant immediately. You would mm-hmm. you'd make every decision in your life based on that. And that's probably not a good way to live. So I can totally understand why all these people are having breakdowns like and freaking out and looting and like going crazy and uh yeah it, it'd be a horrifying i mean i did see somebody uh took screenshots of what all the little screens said so you could read through them and all of them are terrible they're all bleak because not only does yeah. it reveal stuff about like your your life and your health and that but also just like what people think of you and like what your psychological profile is yeah your your social profile yeah. and yeah oh god it would suck it would suck to to learn that stuff it's like you know the the truth like the end of the dark night the, the truth is sometimes the truth isn't good enough like you, it's just not it's not gonna make anything better that, at, that sequence at, was really really good it was really powerful yeah and intense and sad like profoundly sad now that i'm like thinking about it though like the idea that this there's the woman on there that's looking at her child's profile yep and seeing that she's going to suffer from depression and probably kill herself. At the same time, you would think that that would mean, like, who knows what this woman's social economic status is and whether or not she would be able to get the help that she would need for her daughter at that point. But, like, is the, is the Rehoboam profile assuming that she would never be able to get that help for some reason? And, and will this decision to reveal this information to her now change the course of that child's life? Maybe. Or will it drive her towards it? Yeah. Did Rehoboam account for this potentially happening? And I don't know. It's, it's a, it explodes into a hundred more questions that are really fascinating. I think it's, yeah. Is it right before they get on the subway when Dolores says they have a right? Oh, yeah, yeah, because Dempsey's like, D- don't, like, don't you know what it'll do? And she's like, they have a right to know. Mm-hmm. And I, it, that language of saying they have a right, I was like, ah, man, I don't know. <laughs> it, you know, it, it's it's wild within the span of an episode how you can go from rooting against Dolores to rooting for Dolores to rooting against Dolores. And in this moment, I was kind of like, I don't know if you can call that a right. I mean... They have a right not to have their future planned for them by a supercomputer. That I agree with. But having a right to, I mean, I guess, yes, you have the right to choose, but Dolores doesn't give you that option either. She just takes 
takes it and flips it completely around on its head and saying, instead of not having the right to know, now you don't have the right not to know, which is almost equally messed up. As we can see a lot of these people going, like not everyone's equipped to handle this. Yeah. It's not like there's like a primer that came out before the email that was like, you're about to receive an email. You can opt out or opt in kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here it goes. Yeah. But imagine if it happened now. Well, and I guess the thing is, I have to wonder how much of a they have the right to know is Dolores playing to the to the plebs, you know, to to Caleb and to Ash and Giggles kind of being like, I'm we have the right to know about our lives. And because like if in fact what Sirach says is true later in the episode where Dempsey's like, I'm going to go public with all of this experimenting and stuff that you've been doing on people and how you've been using Rehoboam. And Serac says, anytime you've done that, it's led to the extinction of humanity. Like, did Dolores just start the extinction of humanity? Right, yeah. Who knows at this point. And but that is kind of her goal, so... Yeah. Maybe. We have to assume. <laughs> that, like, that's, that's where we thought Dolores was at the end of Season 2, and in Season 3 we've been kind of waffling. I've been waffling on it anyway, but... Yeah, it, it should be interesting. Um, yeah, there was a little bit about Bernard and, uh, and Connell's here, but there's a little bit more about it in the next one. So we can just go straight to that. As the crew leave the subway, they, ob- they observe the chaos on the streets, leashed dogs running wild, people fighting with each other, riding on top of cars and looting stores. Liam says people have already returned to their base selves. Bernard remarks that Dolores is sending everyone off of their loops. Caleb asks what genre he's experience uh Caleb asks what genre he's experiencing and Giggles tells him it's reality. As Caleb watches a ride share pull up and two people get out with guns, Dolores steps in front of him and takes the hits as she kills them both. Caleb is shocked, but Dolores zips up her jacket and moves on. Um I felt like the genre moment with Giggles was a little bit on the nose, but I still appreciated it. <laughs> yeah, I think we can chalk that up to marshawn lynch's performance maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little bit yeah someone but else I, I may have like been Kenya. able to sell it a little better is all i'm saying <laughs> yeah that's true like that's say true. I... an actor <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe um i did like his kind of foreshadowing to that of like oh the fifth act man earlier in the episode mm-hmm. so that, yeah, that was kind of fun true. No, oh, it all it all um, is fine. It all works. Yeah. I think uh Caleb seems to be less comfortable with Dolores as this episode goes on. I think he's starting to realize mm-hmm. that he So Dolores is coming at this from a place of anger, obviously, between the they have a right to know, she's taking them off their loops, like this all of her decision making is based on her experience as a host. And I think she has just a fundamental inability to make any decisions based on uh, empathy in in terms of for humans. And Caleb is human, so we presume. And it just feels like there's glimmers of him. He does have these kind of moments, these kind of decision moments where he is kind of the one to say, like, do it. You know, before Dolores actually Mm -hmm. gives a signal, he kind of says something. I forgot what the dialogue is, but he basically says something along the lines of, like, you know, they they deserve to know kind of thing. Uh, I'd rather live, what does he say? I'd rather live in a world... Uh, I'd rather live in a world of chaos than your... your, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think once he sees kind of what's happening, and then when he sees Dolores clearly reveal she's not human when she takes the two or three shots and then just zips her coat up and says, like, let's go. And he starts to bring it up and she's like, we can talk about it later. And when Dempsey was like, Hey man, she used me. Have you wondered yet what she's using you for? Like, I think it's, I think the doubt is starting to mount in his mind a little bit. And, uh, he's really going to be spinning by the time this episode ends with everything that Dempsey kind of says and the weird kind of flash for flashbacks. I'm sorry that he's having, uh mm-hmm. it's he's definitely going to be in a weird place uh the human side in him is starting to emerge and uh it'll be interesting to see if if and when he decides to betray dolores or, or work with bernard instead yeah i'm assuming yeah. that bernard is the opposing side in all this yeah 
Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that you said. It's not like Caleb. It'll be interesting to see exactly what causes Caleb to pull away. If there is something that causes him to pull away, like, and, but also like, even oh, by the oh, end of this sorry. episode, hold it. You just reminded me, I wanted to say this earlier and I forgot to until now. Uh, we, I don't think we know for sure that anything Dolores tells him is what his actual Rehobo on profile is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I meant to bring yep. that up earlier. That might be the moment where he figures out that she, like, she does know the stuff. Everything that she told him about the diner and his mom and all that, she may have gotten, and that is legit. But as far as his his forecast, so to speak, about his suicide and all that, she may have fabricated that just to manipulate him. I've, what if she made a false profile? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt well, you, but I forgot to get that out earlier. <laughs> no, no, no. That makes that makes I totally agree with that. And some of like uh, I guess we can get to that in a minute, but like it's starting to make me wonder whether or not what Insight knows about Caleb right now is actually true or has always been. You know, like how much of it is Serac being able to tell people what their past was in order to affect some type of journey for them, right? Well, it seems possible, if not likely, by the end of the episode two, that Caleb is one of these outliers outliers who, like yeah. he says, they push them into the army and stuff like that. If he is not even like sort of a winter soldier kind of situation. He might be mm-hmm. sort of have his memories scrubbed or replaced or hidden from him. Scrambled, edited, yeah. who knows? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, I like that Bernard also is kind of able to look at all of the Rehoboam stuff and is like, he Br- Bernard's bulk apperception of the situation in front of him is is very good as well. Just the idea that these hosts are able to walk up to these huge complex ideas and understand like here's what's fucked up about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> when any human could look at it and be like, those are pretty lights and then walk away, you know, discounting a lot of smart people. But anyway. Um it seems like I'm glad that I don't question that the hosts would be able to know these things or get it or understand it. Sure. Just that it feels like they're on the same page as soon as they're learning these things. So I still think that the hosts and Rehoboam are more intrinsically connected than we know so far, based on the the knowledge that twenty years ago some some data was sold. Well, and that's the thing to me. Like I had kind of wondered. Um, there's been some implications that the person who popped, like Sirak mentions earlier in the season, like somebody showed up that we weren't expecting and it's implied that it's Dolores in his conversation with Maeve. But like he also mentions to Maeve later on that he was expecting certain people to show up, Hmm. certain hosts to show up. So I was like, are these hosts visible to Rehoboam in the first place? Or are they the things that are the real outliers that aren't even like part of the model or like Uh. what, in what capacity does Rehoboam understand Westworld, right? Or is it like a big blind spot to it? Hmm. So I think that'll be an interesting question to to cover. But uh, all right, next up we've got uh, Sirach sitting on his plane, angered by the change in Rehoboam's status due to Dolores's actions. He continues his introspective journey. We see that Liam Dempsey Sr. eventually grew wary of what Serac was doing with Rehoboam. He explores a place where Serac and Rehoboam are keeping the, quote, outliers and sending them into high-risk scenarios. Serac is experimenting on these people and trying to edit or change them, causing Dempsey Sr. some alarm. Serac shares that his brother is one of these people and that he was using Rehoboam to look at scenarios where he would kill Dempsey Sr. Um... Lots of good monologuing from Vincent Cassell here. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of, uh, I, it, it seems like we're going to learn more about some of these uh, uh, facilities in the future. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of excited for, for that to kind of understand exactly what can go on there. John brought up a great point that the like uh, 
that the aesthetic of them is very similar to what you see in the Mesa at Westworld or like in the Forge as well, where they're making the simulations of, or yeah, the making the simulations of the humans. Oh, um, from the end of season two. Yeah. So like these like weird glass cages that everybody's in, Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty interesting parallel. Um, and we'll see exactly more about what that means in the future. But, uh, I was kind of theorizing that, like, it seems like, like, the beginning of the episode, Serac mentions that he will take care of the, the, uh, the uprising that might happen in Brazil, and it almost seems to me like he's got his own, like, private military company, or, like, wet works kind of group that can do whatever he wants them to do to affect the change that he needs to see. Definitely. So, that's fucked up and terrifying. But, uh, that's probably where Caleb belonged at some point. Yeah. 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 Him and- no, I, that was what I was going to mention is like some of the exteriors that we see Dempsey senior at, like the complexes that are like next to each other, very industrial looking, very light in color. We see some of that in those flashbacks with, um, Caleb and Francis and whatever they're doing. And Enrique, at least Enrico that's what I, yes the very <laughs> important Enrico Colantoni oh, yes. which I was not expecting and I was very happy to see him yeah, you never expect him uh, and, then he, and then he's there <laughs> you never expect the Colantoni uh-uh. <laughs> but uh, yeah no so I, we'll obviously learn more about that but any other thoughts on this uh, particular scene alright Connell shares details of Reeducation Center 36 Inner Journeys Recovery to Bernard, explaining that this is where Serac is keeping people. One of the facilities where he's keeping people. Stubbs rejoins them and they get the leg up on Connell's. Bernard takes his host freezing button back and demands to know Dolores' plan, but Connell sparts Martel in the lobby below and explains that they need to leave because Bernard is the only one that they can't replace for some reason. Martel walks up to Connell's and tells him that Serac wants a word. They teleconference in Liam's office, and Serac is surprised that there's a mole in Connell's presence. Connell's offers to look into it, but ultimately blows up the entire room, killing himself, Martel, and many others to Serac's shock. Bernard and Stubbs manage to get away, and Stubbs wants to know what the world is ha- what in the world is happening. Bernard, Bernard explains that Dolores' plan is starting, and he thinks he's part of it. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> that line, again, it feels like... In Endgame, Westworld talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Just that, that particular exchange made me feel like it was like coming to a close soon. Well, and like just kind of the... Uh, it's weird to me because I feel like you're completely right, but I did not think of it in that context at all. And I don't know why. Like, I think it's interesting that the show kind of sneaks up on this like apocalypse essentially that's happening in front of your eyes mm. or what could be that. But I don't like it. Maybe I just don't quite understand what like a technologically driven information apocalypse really is. Right. Like maybe that's just such a new idea to me that <laughs> their portrayal of it feels very genuine and I didn't see it as apocalyptic as I might have as as I maybe would have in other scenarios, but it's not like the fucking Terminator drones started flying overhead and the exoskeletons were hopping out to destroy people with their laser guns, right? Not yet. So, yeah, it could still be coming. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's a Westworld without Dolores. Like, I wonder if Dolores were to die in this season, like, for good and achieve something or not achieve it if the show could or would continue without her and what shape that might be this is exactly what i wanted to this is something i've been meaning to touch on for the past couple weeks but i feel like there's been a lot of language talking similar to the way uh chuatella geofor's character is in serenity the idea of creating a world in which they can exist Hmm. um and, you know, like Dolores' plan maybe being giving giving the world, giving Earth to those who made it into the Valley Beyond, even if it's at the cost of her own life, Bernard is still there to finish the job for her right. or something like that. So, 
be interesting. I think the seeds are there. Yeah, but it, you know, who knows exactly how that's going to shake out. Um, I was. It was fun to see Vincent Cassell shocked. Yeah. When Martell explodes. Uh-huh. <laughs> and getting angry, like getting visibly angry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's and the fact that they've established this guy in basically four episodes enough to the point where that i'm entertained by that idea i think is awesome yeah for sure well like when his assistant is like i have news and he's like and he, he says something along the lines of if it's news it's bad because news doesn't exist basically yeah, like new, news isn't a thing to me anymore right. yeah so if there is news it's bad yeah yeah so that it's it's very good Sirak is very well uh, characterized. He's pretty awesome. Yeah, I thought he'd be kind of one note in the first episode yeah. or two, and now I'm like, oh no, he's gonna be, he's gonna rule. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm into it. All right. Yeah, Connell's uh, Connell's going down was pretty cool. It's a bummer that Tommy Flanagan's gonna depart the show, but he went out with a bang, and uh, Stubbs is back. We like we said, he's fine, so that's good. Yeah, get to keep yeah. stubbing on. Stubbs is here. It's okay. Somebody on, I did see somebody on Reddit referred to uh oh they said the only the only death that I'm sad about and it was the bike. It was a, the only character I'm sad died and it was <laughs> Loris's bike. And somebody said don't worry, yeah. he'll return in Stubbs and Bernard. And I was like, "Oh my god. <laughs> Can we get a spin-off movie Stubbs and Bernard?" <laughs> You know, the bike that was on fire that drives by in the scene, I was like, is that the same bike? That'd be so <laughs> is funny. That, is that meant to be? It's just this fucking Ghost Rider bike that's on <laughs> fire driving through the streets. It's the spirit of vengeance just yes, cruising around. Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah, no. I Yeah. Robo bike is, is quite a loyal. That, I, like, when I saw it at the beginning of this episode and it brought Dolores that fucking backpack, I was like, that's Dolores' horse. That's where it exactly, yep. is right there. Yeah, the horse, is, it made it out. That's the that's the other pearl she brought out. <laughs> <laughs> it was yes, the horse, absolutely. now it's a bike. Yes, beautiful. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Dolores and crew take Liam under the dock by the beach. Caleb tries to ask Dolores about how she took those shots, but she says they can talk about it later. They need to get to an airfield and they don't need Liam anymore. Dolores asks Caleb what they should do with him. Liam starts spouting off about how they, the petty criminals, are the real prison to the rest of the world. Quote, we can't fix you and we can't, can't get rid of you, end quote, he says. Uh, Caleb tries to calm him down, but he's shocked about Caleb and how he doesn't know who he actually is himself. Caleb has flashbacks about Francis and a hooded man in a brown overcoat. Someone, potentially Ash, shoots Liam. Caleb tries to help him live, but he ultimately fails. He has flashbacks of Francis as well as receiving some weird treatment with a woman standing over him. The man in the brown overcoat appears to have been a witness at Francis's death. Liam's last words were, you did it to Caleb. Caleb asked Dolores, who does he think I am? There's some weirdness in this episode. Uh, yeah. um, or in this scene. Yep. <laughs> the fact that like I don't know who shot Liam definitively. Like, it's played off like it's Ash, but for some reason the bullet's on the wrong side of his body. It feels like it was Caleb. It, f- it certainly felt like it was Caleb, but we never see him holding a gun. Yeah. Um, so... It is weird. And then there there was other weirdness that other people pointed out that was things like Liam's shirt drying at one point immediately, even though it gets soaked by the seawater. So I don't want to believe that we're looking at a bunch of continuity issues, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is weird. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. A lot of weirdness here. But, yeah. Enrico Colin Tony. Great news. Very exciting. Excited to learn more. I think his his uh I'm trying to think of who he was actually listed as, but uh he's got a good a good one one name one name name in the credits of this episode. And I'm trying to see if somebody's listed it on his uh Wikipedia yet. He's playing Whitman, the character of Whitman, so Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, Liam's, Liam's kind of speech about how the system isn't the prison. You are the prison to all of us. We can't fix you and we can't get rid of you. 
Like this idea that like all of those outliers are something that need to be sacrificed in order to make it into the future is just kind of weird and sad. And also like, like I didn't even necessarily like think of when I think of an outlier, I try to like, I, I think of something that's rare or doesn't make sense or doesn't fit in and for some reason the idea that these like criminals on the rico app or whatever are the ones that don't necessarily fit in it didn't like occur to me that way Mm. um i mentioned earlier about the rehoboam interface which was a little bit more like theorizing by me but he mentions how it's the eclipse and that we see this ring of like black dots that are kind of coming off of the edge of it like coronal ejections off of the sun or something like that but um the fact that like they need to disappear or be controlled to kind of continue the the vision of the system i think is interesting and and weird to me like i don't the meaning that they've imbued upon that interface is is cool in this episode and i like it and i don't know that my like assumptions about it are right as of yet but i'm I don't know if we're going to learn more or not, you know? Mm-hmm. So I liked that every time we went back in like Serac's life, it was like there were time machine views of Rehoboam at the time, like of that interface at the time. It's like a tunnel that forms of them, but I don't really quite know exactly what that means. If it's like a slice of time or like what, what are we actually looking at when we see that thing? Yeah. You know? I don't know. I don't know if we're going to so, find out. But yeah, we might I not. hope we do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't begrudge the death of Liam. That's fine. I think he served his purpose by this point in the season. He did. Which is okay. Honestly, this is the most that I liked his character, probably. Or that I at least saw what he meant to do. Yeah, when he when he died, I was like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. It it wasn't worth keeping him around just for for no reason. Yeah. Um. Any other thoughts on the scene at the docks? No. I I mean I'm not going to speculate on it any further until uh, you know, we learn more. Yeah. There's nothing. That's nothing right. much to say until we uh, figure out what the hell is going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Next up. Serac receives a report that Dolores was after his files in Rehoboam. We take another look back on the introspective journey. Serac is in a car in the desert with Dempsey Sr. Dempsey no longer wants to be party to the shaping of the world that Serac is doing. They spot smoke in the distance and pull up to it and get out of the car. Dempsey threatens to go public with the information about what Serac is doing, and Serac informs him that every projection Rehoboam ran where he does that resulted in human extinction. We also hear voiceover of Serac explaining that he has ensured Rehoboam will outlive both his brother and him. And it turns out that the smoke is coming from a crashed plane owned by Dempsey Sr., so Serac kills him on the spot to make it look like an accident. Um, yeah, that was uh, super villain Serac, I think. Like, the the little bouts of violence that he has in him when he killed Jiang a couple episodes ago and when he kills Dempsey Sr. here, I think is, you know, pretty pretty horrifying um but yeah not yeah. not altogether surprising i was like okay this is the scene where he, i was like come on dempsey man have you seen a movie you know what's going <laughs> down here don't get out of that limo but at the same time mm-hmm. yeah. you cannot you can't fight that guy you can't fight Sirak. like at that point he's he's the most powerful man in the world and it it's funny because it does I mean, we'll we'll have it, it remains to be seen the ultimate fate of everybody on the show. But I used to think Ford was the most powerful man in the world, or then I used to think it was William. And now I'm like, and these guys are small fish compared to this dude. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they were running Westworld. This guy's running the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> including Westworld. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Well, and the fact that they've like successfully gotten us there. Like, we understand that now, and they, they made it narratively satisfying to follow that there's this dude controlling the world in the way that there were puppeteers in Westworld, I yeah, think is... that's true. We're just, we're just pulling, we're going slightly wider on the magnifying glass every, every yep. time. 
And then we'll zoom out of the Earth and see Galactus standing there as he's... Yes, you know, and then zoom out of that, and it's the end of Men in Black, and it's just an alien grabbing a little marble and throwing it in his bag. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the line uh, that is in the voiceover, uh, Vincent Cassell says, And that is how you came to be, Mon ami. My brother and I brought you into this world, and now I've ensured that you will outlive us both. That the stra- uh, That the strategy will succeed. Um, there, I saw like some Reddit posts theorizing about like what has Serac done to give Rehoboam sentience maybe in the way that some of the hosts have achieved, like what, what has, what is that thing that he did to ensure that it will live on beyond him? Um, I think is an interesting idea and we'll see what it is like Uh, did this line come after he got that data that he's trying to get from dolores and he's uploaded it into the system and he's able to make rehoboam its own being and be an actual god i don't know so yeah uh yeah the the when of of when this vo is happening is what i'm really interested in like uh, yeah could he could Rehoboam be having virtual lessons in, in, within itself, and he's slowly teaching it how to how to think in in yeah. a way that is beyond just just simply computing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um. All right. And then the final scene of the episode: Dolores was watching Serac's memory of killing Dempsey Senior in an air hangar. She's talking to a hologram of Serac in the hangar. Serac tries to tell Dolores that he'll go to great lengths to protect humankind. But Dolores thinks it's time for everyone to wake up. Caleb accepts a mysterious delivery for Dolores and wonders whether or not Liam was right and not everyone should know their fate. Dolores explains that people have a right to know after all Caleb wanted to know, right? Caleb suspects that he's not like other people and Dolores says she isn't either. That's when that line is. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think that uh, it seems like the beginning of next episode we might have Dolores explaining what exactly she is to Del- uh, to Caleb? Yeah. Maybe. Um but yeah. I liked how the projection of Serac in this scene was obvious enough that like it was following Dolores and like the lighting on him was it matched what the lighting of him in his airplane with the sunlight on him was, right. not like what he would look like in the hangar. Yeah, in that same space. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. That's a pretty cool effect. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. No, we'll see what uh, what happens here. The one thing that I was going to remark on that we haven't necessarily explicitly talked about yet was, like, the idea that they revealed all of this insight data was the thing to me that felt like it would happen in, like, episode seven or eight. Oh, right? yeah. So the fact that we are so far ahead of schedule was weird to me until you just kind of mentioned the idea that, like, what if this is the end? Which very well could be, and kind of makes sense. Uh, honestly, it makes me very sad. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's probably a good thing, if it is. <laughs> I'd rather miss it than be glad it's gone, you know? Yeah, for sure. I don't th- I don't think this will be the last one. I'd be, I would feel like they would have already revealed that information. But, uh, you know, it might be another two years before we see four or two, three years. But, yeah, um, we'll see. I don't know. I, I I truthfully don't think it is, but I think that my gut was feeling that way, and I was like, I don't really believe this, but it kind of feels like it's possible. You're feel you're feeling like things have been accelerated, which I think totally stands. Mm. And I think some of it was like we're like, oh, they only have eight episodes now, but it feels like it's eclipsing that even is the thing. <laughs> so yeah, just you know. even in like some of the dialogue exchanges and and that kind of thing. It just feels like they're writing it that direction. Mm-hmm. But I'm probably wrong. Been wrong. I've been wrong about more than I've been right about this season. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we're doing a pretty good job of keeping our heads above water. Yeah. So. Try not to get swept away in all the tinfoil hat thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. But that's partly what the show is about just speculating. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Trying to, That's trying what to beat the machine, trying to get off our loops. Several years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. 
Once again, you can find more episodes of our podcast on Westworld.fm. We're also on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Podcasts. We're Westworld FM on Twitter, and you can email us at westworldfm at gmail.com to tell us what you think of our show. Tell us if you think this is the end. Tell us if you think you want more Westworld, or you don't. Tell us why you feel those things. We'd love to hear them. The Midwest Podcast Network has several other shows about video games, horror movies, and more. Check out all of our shows at midwestpodcastnetwork.com. Uh, our theme music is the song Industrial Cinematic by Kevin McLeod, and it is being used under an Attribution Creative Commons license. That's it for our episode this week. We're excited for the next episode of Westworld, and we'll have another episode of our podcast out after that. But until then, may you rest and have a deep and dreamless slumber. Jonah Nolan was pulling the idea, f- a lot of the ideas for Rehoboam from uh, a book called Standing in- Standing on Zanzibar, I believe. Let me double check that as I say it. But it just makes me think, um, Stand on Zanzibar is what it's called. It's a novel from 1968 by John Brunner, and it involves uh, an AI at a company that uh, is in the 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 lobby just like Rehoboam is in this and the name of the the AI as I look it up right now (laughs) Uh, sorry while Alex is doing that I am enjoying a delicious (laughs) sip of redemption rye I have just recently gotten into drinking ryes after many years of just bourbons and whiskeys I decided to try something new and it worked out I had this one recommended to me along with several others, and this was the affordable option at my local liquor store, which is open during all this quarantine. Uh, The other one was Pikesville, which I hear is very delicious, and another one called High West, which the name and the label were very appealing to me, but the bottle was like $70, so I didn't buy it. But I'd recommend it. (laughs) Well, thank you for your your review. No problem. Uh... I'm going to look it up now because, uh, Alex, what are you drinking? I'm drinking some carbonated, uh, grape (laughs) Kool-Aid. You're still doing that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, which was carbonated using a, uh, so you put the water in the soda stream and then you squeeze the grape Kool-Aid flavoring from one of those little bottles where they give you the concentrated grape Kool-Aid. Because people are too lazy to mix up the the dry solution anymore. But it works very well buying those things and putting them in carbonated soda stream water. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. It's not like normal grape Kool-Aid with good sugar. No, it's definitely terrible sweetener aspartame bullshit. Um, but maybe I'm like Cypher from The Matrix in that way, where I like the fake stuff. Just... Just give me the fake stuff. <laughs> Looks like uh, the book might be called Pale Fire. 